Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really, really excited to do this because, you know, for those of you who do know or don't know, um, there's a lot of discussion in veterinary medicine, not even veterinary medicine, in animal rehabilitation about unifying all the different professions that um, perform animal rehabilitation. And um, I wanted to bring some calm <laughs> uh, discussion on what that what unity can look like. So I brought um, four different people to discuss this. Uh, myself, uh, Deanna Rogers, Jen Panko, and Dr. Nardo Robinson. Um, I'll introduce myself first. Uh, I graduated from the Ontario Veterinary College in Canada in 2002. I did my bachelor's of science uh, prior to that. I practiced in small animal medicine um, until I stopped uh, and did rehab full time a few years ago. Um, but I started doing rehab in 2012. I added acupuncture to that in 2016. I finished my certification. So um, I now own a referral only rehab pain management and rehab uh, practice in Ontario. Um, I have myself. Um, I have a part-time DVM rehab vet as well. I have two CCRP technicians. I have a Chi acupuncturist who works um, for me as well um, that uh, graduated from Mexico. And then I have about five assistants that help us out throughout the day, whether that's helping with water treadmill or answering phones or communicating with clients. Um, and that, that we've trained, so at least they have the background of why we're using some of the modalities. Um, and if we need them to sit with a patient, at least they're kind of aware of things to worry about and things to watch for, but we're always in the building with them. Um, my technicians are amazing and all my, my associates are amazing. So um, that's kind of how my practice works. Uh, we are referral only because I felt like, so I was a general practitioner for many, many, many years, I guess if you can consider 18 years, many, many. Um, and I know what it's like as a veterinarian to have a patient doing things that you have no idea what's going on. And to earn trust of other veterinarians and other practitioners, I wanted to make sure that they knew exactly what was happening. In order for that to happen, I wanted to have a referral on on file. So we will not see them without that, unless for some reason they are moving to the area, they haven't seen anyone and something major is going on, and then I will help them find a, a local veterinarian for general practice. But it, since we don't do general practice, I make sure that they have something somewhere um, to take care of that patient. Uh, I think that's it for me um and we actually won't book them we used to but we won't book them appointments now until we have full medical records um x-rays if they're done anything that we can potentially have on file because i feel like that even when you when clients leave and go to another practice it's required by law for us to send that information and i think for client care it's super important so when i talk about unity and rehab that's one of the biggest things that um, I try and emphasize and I think is super, super important, whether it's um, PTs and vets working together, technicians and vets working together, um, chiros and vets working together, whatever the professions are, I think it's imperative to have all of that information because clients are wonderful, but do they always remember the details of things that are going on or that are said? Um, and so I think, that's where I'm coming from, from my perspective, and that's my background. So Deanna, do you want to introduce sure. yourself? Sure, yeah. I'm Deanna Rogers, and I'm a human trained physical therapist that um, also does animals. And I graduated from PT school in 1985 from Texas Women's University in Houston, got a master's degree. My human practice, I did, um, till 2011 and all of my human practice was in geriatrics. I was uh, board certified as a geriatric PT. Um, I started working with animals in 2004, working through uh, getting my canine rehabilitation 
Association and worked with a group of folks to get our Practice Act changed in Colorado. And so then I officially started my animal PT business in 2008 and became full time there in 2011. So I have a mobile practice and I go to people's homes and treat their pets there. I also spent um, about oh seven, eight years also um, working at a rehab clinic that was an ER and rehab clinic, which was wonderful. So as for me um, and in Colorado, we do have to get what's called veterinary medical clearance, which is like a referral. So definitely have to have that. And because I'm a one man show, so to speak, I don't have technicians or assistants or whatever. And therefore, I'm pretty much on my own. I do a lot of communicating with the other members of that animal's um, veterinary health care. But and particularly in the way of uh, communicating notes and what I'm doing in rehab and the rehab plan development and that type of thing. So um, collaboration for me is is critical. It's kind of my lifeline since I'm out there on my own. Um, I really value having that interaction with the other members of that animal's team. So. Do you want to go next, Jen? Let's sure. kind of work our way around that square. Right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm pretty much still in bed. It's pretty early over here. And I'm trying to be quiet because my little person's sleeping. And that's just treasured time. I'm not going to lie. Um, oh, he's awake. Yes. Hey, I'm talking on my phone right now. But you can go play with toys or grab your favorite snack out of the cupboard. Go for it. Make your choice. I think I did it. Um, <laughs> he's looking at me like, what? Anyways, I have a small animal rehab facility in British Columbia that I moved across Canada to work at. And I was so excited to move here. I love it. I was from Ontario, like Danielle. Um, and I worked there for about a year. And then I went on maternity leave. And when I returned, I purchased it, which was exciting. And I was going to collaborate. I was going to do all these great things. Um, fortunately for the veterinarian that I worked closely with, he was able to buy another practice, which didn't stress me out at all. We were still going to collaborate. It was going to be fine. And now he's gone. <laughs> and I took it so hard. Um, but the village has stepped up. Um, so I have Dr. Susan Calverly, who is a rehab vet, a CCRT. She also does amazing work with orthopets. She is my out of the box thinker. So if you're old, if you're complicated, if there is no solution, guess what? Susan's got one. So she shows up and she makes it happen. Um, and then I also have Dr. David Lane in Squamish, who's boarded sports med vet, who will see anything for me. So I am maybe not the best business person, but I do have a good business model in the sense of everybody has a good veterinary patient care relationship type thing. If they come and see me, and I don't feel like the diagnosis is sufficient for a technician to be treating. And I have learned more about that since I've been in this situation. Um, I send back to the family vet. I also will send directly to Dave. I will send to Susan as well, keeping the family vet involved, of course. So I have, it's so weird. You'd think as you gained experience, you would know more, but it's more like I know more about what I don't know, which is great. And a very good skill as a technician. Um, so And as a veterinarian, just saying. Right. Like, it's just that thing of, I get texts being like, are you on your own? Oh, my gosh, it must be so amazing. And I'm like, I'm not on my own. I wouldn't want to be on my own. I can't be on my own. Um, the thought of being on my own gives me a complete crisis. <laughs> um, so the village has stepped up. And for that, I'm so grateful. I would love to add to my team. I haven't met anybody that has wanted to be on my team, which isn't a reflection on me. It's a shortage of the people available at this point. Um, but that being said, I am so lucky to have who I have. Um, and I'm also so lucky that I have the trust of the community. So the other thing that I do, so say you're a general family veterinarian and you send a patient to me and I don't feel it's suitable for rehab. Guess what? I spend probably an hour with your client and I don't charge them which is shocking. There's always that, what? But my feeling is I send it back to you. I send it to Dr. Lane. I send it to Dr. Susan. 
we refer to surgery, neuro, et cetera, whatever that looks like for that pet. If it's meant for me to treat as a technician, it will come back to me. If it's not, it won't, but those people will hopefully tell other people about me. So I call it the boomerang effect. Um, could I charge those clients? Yes, they value my time. They appreciate it, all that stuff. I am just very focused as a technician in staying in my lane. And my lane in British Columbia is not diagnosis. It's not prescription. It's not stepping out of the role of treating what it has been sent for. So that's how I stay in my lane. I don't know if it's the right answer, but that's my comfort zone. Um, previously, I did work with three human physical therapists in Ontario at a referral hospital. I also did work in a sports medicine practice with a lovely veterinarian. And what else have I done? Oh, I started the program at the University of Guelph. I forget about that one all the time. Um, and unfortunately, in that situation, I was on my own. Um, the surgeon was across the parking lot, I guess. And he was available as much as possible. And everything came with a vet um, diagnosis, referral, all that stuff. But I did not have the opportunity to collaborate. And I really struggled in that specific environment with big, complex cases not having anybody to really bounce ideas off of on a regular basis. I um, mean, it's not that there weren't people there. There were. They just weren't available to me to the degree that I like. Like Dr. Lane, as much as I see him maybe twice a year, he is a message away and I can SOS him and say, hey, it ain't right. I also have learned as I've gotten a little bit older that there are minimal rehab emergencies. So if something isn't right, I don't have to do anything that day. There is nothing my laser is going to do today or that I'm going to do today that is going to affect the outcome unless it's an emergency case, which it needs to be going to see someone else anyways. So I think that age experience, all that stuff has kind of calmed me down about it all and made me a more objective, reasonable practitioner. As for unity. Did you also, did you also think though, that, you know, Tara's Facebook site that we've started supporting one another and all of these other online resources where we can text each other and we can shoot a message to someone and say, hey, like, what do you think? Because this case is like not doing better or it's kind of way out of my comfort zone or whatever, yeah. that it makes things easier. Would that have helped when you were at OVC um, to be able to say, hey, can you kind of help me out? I'm going to like send you some videos and pictures and stuff and see what yeah, they maybe. think. It might have. Um, I just, my time there was limited. So I was hired as a rehab tech, but I was often in the general practice doing general practice stuff. And I am someone that thrives in the discussion collaboration mode. So for me, there was no one to celebrate with. There was the students and they, I mean, they were along for the ride. They were all about it. Um, so, I mean, that portion was fantastic. But I also struggled coming out of Mississauga Oakville, where I was, where it was a yes environment and we could see anything to suddenly we weren't taking referrals. We were only seeing in-house patients. I went from being the yes girl in Ontario to the no girl. And it really made me struggle. So I think mm -hmm. that I am in a good environment. Um, the village, thank gosh for the village. I can't even say good enough things about them, um, has supported me and kept me going. And thank gosh they have, because I don't think without them I would have kept going because I didn't think it was ethically right. Um, yeah, but as for unity, I know that's what we're kind of headed towards. My view is everybody has a place on the team. Anybody who wants to work with me, anybody who's interested in doing what I'm doing is a valuable resource. And it comes down to, unfortunately, business model, right? What can we make work? So for me, a business model is what can you bring to the practice? You can make as much money out of my practice as you want. If you can help me make that money as well. And it's not all about money. Because believe me, I'm still paying for the thing. But it is about being successful together. So yeah, and you know what? And you've proven, and there's lots of technician-owned businesses and PT-owned businesses, direct access isn't... You know, we don't have to be there watching. Hi, Connor. <laughs> watching over your mama's head and going, Jen, don't do that. Jen, because I think your training and your knowledge bring comes into that. And you're like, this is 
something's not right here. I'm going to seek some other advice. And I think, so I think, I think the legislation that's coming forward in multiple places about direct access isn't necessary, um, but some sort of regulation for collaboration is necessary. That's my yeah, thought. I had some discussions this week about assuming everyone has integrity, right? Assuming that yes. we all want the best thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not out there saying I'm a surgeon or a chiropractor or anything that I'm not. I'm not buying expensive modalities that I don't know how to use. I'm not recommending things that don't make sense. So I think that having a genuine trust between ourselves is the first step to presenting that to the community. So checking okay. in and saying, hey, this is what I've experienced or hey, Mm, I saw a case like this once and it didn't go so well. I have um, Trina Legg out on the island is a lovely technician that does rehab. Her and I go back and forth about cases all day. She's like, what do you got? I'm like, mm, what do you got? <laughs> and it's fun, right? For me, it's that collaboration. And with these COVID times, it has slowed us down and made us um, look at things a bit differently and how we do things. I'm so lucky that I have a porch that is in front of the practice that I can do gym stuff on and meet with the clients and develop those relationships. I think that mentally, if I was just taking dogs out of cars all day and not having client relationships, I would really wilt as an extreme extrovert. Let's just call it what it is. Um, I value that time in the gym. And when somebody says to me, I want gym time, I'm like, yes, this is my people. These are my people. Um, so I thrive in the gym environment. If I had the chance, I would hire someone to run the water treadmill and I would do all the other things because that's what I want to be doing right now. I'm doing it all toilet paper to vacuuming to changing filters. Even this guy vacuums, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mom, we got to listen. Mom, should I can have anything. Oh, the fridge or the cover. Can I have a caramel apple? You can have a caramel apple this one time. Go for it. Yeah. We heard that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Darla, if you want to introduce yourself, you have, um, I, your, your background's varied because you come from a human perspective and a DVM perspective, right? right. Um, you want to talk about yourself. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I, I graduated from osteopathic medical school back in 1988. <laughs> and then uh, shortly thereafter, got my medical acupuncture training. And, and then by 97, I graduated from vet school, Colorado State University, uh, and started their first acupuncture program and then stayed there for the next 20 years, teaching scientifically based integrative medicine. And um, so that was until about 2016. And now I just solely run um, the educational institution, Cura Corvette, and then the human part is Cura Corps Med. And that's how I met you, as you know, Danielle, because uh, you took our medical acupuncture for veterinarians course and then became an instructor shortly thereafter. You're one of the most favorite instructors. Now you teach in our rehab course, the MOVE course. And I met uh, Deanna back in the early to mid 2000s because and Deanna has lots of great stories about that. Deanna was there at the beginning of the um, dialogue between physical therapists and the veterinary medical board in Colorado. And so I got to meet Deanna and also Carrie used to be Adamson. Now it's Carrie Adrian. Um, and so from the veterinary side, I worked with the Colorado Veterinary Medical Association. And then it, it was an arduous task for several years, but, um, but it culminated in the provision of a model of collaboration between physical therapists and veterinarians that I'm learning now a lot of other states are trying to emulate or derive their own laws from. Um, but there, I think there always needs to be ongoing communication and accountability and transparency are very important to me. And if uh, whatever the profession, I want to know what is your background? What are your hours of training? What are your hours of safety? Uh, because if you're asking to add something to your scope of practice and wanting to perform that on patients, I think that 
you need to have a fundamental understanding of what's going on there. You know, you're jumping into maybe another species. So from human to vet or vet to human. I know when I did uh, wildlife rehabilitation before I went to vet school, I was a volunteer and I started working with the wildlife there under the um, just uh, under the supervision of the veterinarian. And um, and because because they asked me to do acupuncture, they knew that I was an osteopathic physician and did medical acupuncture. And I loved the results, but I didn't want to just for the rest of my life have to have a veterinarian supervising me. So that's why I decided to go to vet school. I love animals. I never want to hurt anybody. I never want anybody else to hurt anybody. And so with the work that I did with a physical therapist, I had also previously to that uh, worked on scope of practice issues with animal chiropractors. And I just learned last night that there are human acupuncturists trying to gain access to animal treatment in uh, one of the neighboring states. And so this is an ongoing issue. And um, I agree that that it's nice to have conceptual unity, but I also think that it's important for people to uh, be able to back up what they're doing and to and to verbalize to me and to animal owners and to the legislature and to anybody what what do you know and and how is this going to apply and like Deanna has always said uh, the she values you know knowing knowing your field but also knowing your limitations and I think that that is an issue that comes up because. When I was working under veterinary supervision before vet school, I had no even conceivable knowledge of what I didn't know because I didn't go to vet school. And I had lots of human knowledge, but as they say, you know, cats are not small dogs. Well, cats and dogs are not small humans. And it's easy to not know that. And I see people getting defensive about that, but you just, you don't know what you don't know, as has been said uh, in in the past. But um, so the more dialogue, the more honesty, the more willing to um, come to the table and not just run away because your feelings get hurt. But it's like, let's have an honest discussion. So that's my perspective. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I get my feelings hurt a lot. <laughs> because I'm a sensitive introvert. <laughs> um, and it's easy for me to just go, I don't know if I want to get out there anymore. Um, I get so excited. I get so excited to think of the potential for unity and all of us coming together and really working together and referring to one another. Um, and I, you know, I'll text my, my human PT because she's a CCRP as well. And I'll say, okay, I need another opinion. Or can I ask you something about like legislation and, you know, what your knowledge base is and what you've learned and where you think your deficits are. And I think it's good to have those conversations, but then sometimes I feel like everyone, and I'm not saying PTs only or vets only, everyone just kind of gets on this, like, I don't need anybody else. And um, that doesn't get us anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, when I was legitimately the most excited was, um, we did some a bit of a rehab course um, on ortho conditions and then on neuro conditions for veterinarians uh, through CuraCore a few weeks ago. And that's when I met Deanna. And it was, I was a little like, and I, this is me being honest. I was like, is this a good idea? <laughs> Who's this Deanna person? <laughs> Who is and, that person? <laughs> teaching and I didn't know that. I, know about. I didn't know she was hesitant. I didn't find out about that till day before yeah. yesterday. <laughs> oh, right. But I'm like, you're so, first of all, you're so lovely. And um, so open and so willing to talk about things. And multiple times, I remember when we were going through things, you'd be like, oh, I didn't know that. And and if you if you watch, you know, she's writing stuff down all the time. Um, I you have seen me doing that here. <laughs> I, know, I know, she's like, I need my pencil and I need paper and I need my <laughs> job. Um, and watching her teach, I learned things. And I think, again, it doesn't matter. You've been doing, you've been doing this for a very, very long time. Yeah. And, yeah. and, so I think, you know, even you going, oh, I didn't know that. And I'm like, wow, you have so much knowledge about things that I didn't know about. I, this is this 
is what unity was. And I came off of that week and I was like, yes, like, let's do this. And then, you know, I was, then I went to the unity discussion and I was like, I feel like there's just so much anger and it kind of hurts my heart a little. And so I feel like, did I go into it with an open mind? No, I did not. Um, and we all have our own baggage that we're kind of dealing with. But I feel like listening to you guys talk about what happened in Colorado and then teaching with you a few weeks ago, I was like, yeah, there's so much we can do. So, you know, how do we get this accomplished, I guess, is our is our next goal. What does unity mean? And, you know, I said it before, but definitely accountability. And I know that that touches on legislation and I know worldwide it's different everywhere. Um, but if you know, and if we can get some sort of standard of practice to say direct supervision isn't necessary, right? We don't need vets standing over if we can guarantee that someone is regulating medical records, right? Someone is regulating biosecurity. Someone is regulating all of these things and medical records are going back and forth between practitioners because to me, that's essential for patient care. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of comparisons to human side of things, but man, I mean, I've gone through the human side of things from a personal perspective with myself, with my mom, and it was not something that I would ever want to mirror in veterinary medicine. It is, veterinary medicine isn't meant to be like that. So disconnected and, you know, I know there's comments about human side of thing and interprofessional collaboration and stuff, but Maybe that's in certain places, but definitely that is not something that I experienced when my mom was in the hospital. Um, and I think, and, oh, go ahead. No, no, you, you, you talk. Well, I, I mean, think the human, the human medical field, in some areas, it can be a template for what we might be, might like to do, but also a template for what we don't want to do. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I get that. And the other thing I want to point out is. You, you can't have collaboration without communication, but you can have communication without collaboration. So I think both of those things are so critically important um, because even though, for example, um, I'll be sending notes to the vets and, and whatnot about what I'm doing, most of the time I don't hear anything back from the vets. Um, and I understand, I mean, they're not gonna have time to go and read my notes every time I see somebody, but they know that it's there in the record if they need it. Now, if I if I need their input or have a question or problem or concern, there are some vets who are great about getting back with me right away. Others don't get back with me, but they get with the owner. Um, so they'll, they'll go that way. And some just, you know, don't don't communicate at all. And if that ends up being the case, if there's uh, like a family vet and then a vet that comes and does acupuncture or whatever, if I'm worried about the patient and I can't get a communication with the vet that's made the referral to me, then I'll then I will pull in even in a stronger fashion another vet that can help me with a particular problem if it if it's a time sensitive issue. And I try not to step on people's toes, but I have to be that pet's advocate and that client's advocate and have to do that. But that whole working together, I'm like you, Jen. I mean, I, I just love it. And I've been that way from the get go, even in my human practice. I was the only PT working in this nursing home, which I love, love, loved. And the my boss at the time, the administrator of the nursing home, was absolutely wonderful, got me connected with the um, therapy department at the local hospital. So I had um, their assistant director. She would come and do case reviews with me every month. And I could go to their lunch and in services and just stayed connected that way. Um, learned so much just being around a lot of people and, and getting their ideas about treatments. And I'm still doing that even with all these years of practice. Because I don't, I mean, there's so much that I don't know. And like you said, even the things we learned from the course that we taught. I mean, just because I might be an instructor does not mean I know everything. And how I practice today was different than I practiced six months ago. And how I'm going to practice six months down the road. It's just a work in progress. 
Yeah, and 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 just yeah, I mean, just who you are. I mean, I hope people can can get who you are, like just your demeanor, your cautiousness, your care and and love for the profession. And and you told me the other day too that you would attend your your human patients oh, right. doctors visits. Yeah. Um. And so that you could learn more, and yeah. and and that that further built the collaboration. And and you are as careful and methodical and. I know maybe you don't like this word, the reliable piece or something that you got the award for. Oh, right? yeah. uh, dependable. Dependable. Um, yeah. Dependable. But just uh, you're 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 so easy to work with and you're so honest. Um, that then in the mid 2000s after we worked out all that legislation and I had a case at Colorado State um, where the client was was heavily demanding um, physical therapy and and acupuncture from me, but then that's when I got permission from the hospital director the mm -hmm. first time ever that any physical therapist, at least in the small animal world, um, came to treat an animal. And and I still show that video to this day be, because you, you're what I love and why I wanted you as part of our rehabilitation course is because you think about that individual, who they are today, who they're going to be long term, what the client's needs are, what the client can perform. You don't push things, you know, it's obviously not one of these kind of assembly line kind of rehab things that was one of the inspirations that made me want to start the CuraCore rehab course, because I want to express this patient tailored, specific diagnosis, lots of hands on, bring in the osteopathic piece, the myofascial piece, the physical therapy piece, everything, acupuncture, integrative, massage. Um, and and it was, it, it's just like you sh showed so much just care and compassion that that's just the embodiment of of what i see what i would want to see this profession going toward well and also too like in your video too there's times that i'm sitting there with you while you're doing the acupuncture right because i'm like teach me about this i mean i don't do acupuncture and i don't do dry needling and and, and there's so much i don't even know and understand about acupuncture and so i'm like a little sponge it's like <laughs> you know to tell me how this works and I and to see it with my own eyes uh -huh. um, and all that was just so exciting. And and I think to the owner really appreciated. She just felt supported yeah. on so many levels. Um, and she knew this was a, kind of an experiment for us as well. Mm -hmm. And she was trusting enough, as was little Cece, yeah. um, <laughs> to let us work with her and and do that. Um, so, yeah. And like you said, I forgot about. Yes, I did go with some of my human patients when I was working in the nursing home. I would go with them to their doctor's appointments, particularly their orthopedic and neuro appointments, um, because I just wanted to learn from these physicians in the community and how they operate and be there as an advocate for my senior patient and uh, just develop some really nice relationships with the physicians in the community and the medical director at our nursing home. We did care conferences every week, alternating patients through there. So that team approach was just ingrained in me from day one in how I worked with my human patients. And I, I love it. That's one, one of the things I really miss not being at the rehab clinic because there's yeah such a lovely group of people there um, that I continue to interact with um, and learn from, you know, even, even to this day, even though I'm not physically there working with them anymore, we have these connections that we can keep forever, you know, and right. learn from. So, so, I mean, I know what I learned in vet school uh, about rehab, which was nothing. Um, and, <laughs> Like so nothing. Um, and, you know, even a couple of years ago, I remember talking to a vet student. And I was like, how's that going? Like, you know, are they introducing that? Knowing that we have this whole facility now at the Ontario Veterinary College with a swimming pool and a water treadmill and a boarded rehab person and all of these things that she does acupuncture. And, and they said we got one slide in ortho in our lectures and that was it. And I was like, that's weird. Um, you know, especially when but it's not, it's not across universities, right? So, you know, MSU has a great rehab program, CSU and Nardica, maybe you can maybe tell me more about how that works there. Um, 
And University of Tennessee, they have this incorporated into their program, whether or not that every vet student is exposed to it or not, I don't know. Um, but I had a vet student with me this, this this past week and there was, she was blown away by not only what she thought rehab was, cause she said they got about 20 minutes. So I guess it's getting better. <laughs> 20 minutes on rehab and, you know, swimming is great for arthritis and cruciates and all these other things is what she was told. And I was like, okay, so let's talk about that. Um, and there's still a huge gap of knowledge, but again, where it does it depend on university, right? So these vets, students that I met at MSU, their knowledge of rehab and, and physical medicine and all of these other things is way more than the other students graduating. So I feel like, you know, I don't know what techs get. And is that in, is that dependent on where they graduate from, Jen? Like I know Northern has a rehab program. I don't know who teaches it, um, but Sheridan does not. And again, there's tech schools everywhere. So, so let's start, and just PTs don't get animal rehab in their regular program, I'm assuming, Deanna. No, I think they might have a little bit now in some of them, but um, again, it's very small. So in Colorado, we came up with these minimum criteria you have to meet for educational hours and topics, as well as clinical hours and topics before you could even consider practicing on animals because we wanted to uh, emphasize just because you're a human trained PT does not mean you can automatically go and treat animals. And that too is, has been uh, what also the animal special interest group with the American Physical Therapy Association has worked on as well as, you know, it, it, it doesn't work that way. You get your human PT license and then you can go and hang, hang your shingle to work on animals. It, it just doesn't work that way. It's not the best thing for consumer safety. You need extra training for that. And I, I want to give an example because, you know, I think of there, there's been a couple times where, you know, I have such great relationship with the referring vets that refer to us. You know, they're like, oh, we haven't seen this dog in like a year, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's senior. It's, you know, it's it's weak on the hind end. The owners don't want to do medications. Can I just send the referral off to you? And I, and I've gone, whatever, sure, right? I'm a vet, I can see this. And, you know, it comes over and then I'm like, something's not right. And I do a physical exam and it's got a basketball in its abdomen, right? So the bleeding hermangiosarcoma is probably why it was a little bit weaker in its hind end. But would, like my fear, and, and so my fear without referral from a veterinarian, so had they seen that dog, and then referred it, they probably would have caught that first, right? So without referral from a veterinarian who's done a proper physical exam and evaluated that patient, that is my fear going to a non-DVM who may not pick those things up. Is it a real fear? I don't know. Jen, do you see anything that, like do you always get medical records and everything else? You said you get diagnosis. Yeah, it's, it varies. And honestly, I'm on it. And if it smells like anything other than straight <laughs> up success to me, it's out the door. Yeah. And that's not me being, sometimes I've had the like, you know this, and I'm like, oh, I do know this. <laughs> oh, I know it. But it doesn't serve anybody for me to know more than I should as a technician. So I don't pride myself on that. Um, I also think that from the student standpoint that you were talking about, mm -hmm. mentors are key. And I do not mentor anyone right now. No fault of this little person, but yeah. he keeps <laughs> very busy. Um, and I have said no to mentoring because I would be an awful mentor at this point in my life, right? I don't have that to give. I just don't. Um, I you saw me cut up a caramel apple during a <laughs> like, that is where I'm at. Yeah. Like I'm awesome. I'm the best ever. Well, um, you're managing a lot. You're managing a business. You're managing a, ch managing a child, right? You're right. Yeah, you're stuff going on. There's only um, so much you can do. And I do hear like monitoring mentor, no monitoring 
moderating. That's the word I'm looking for in the English language, the unity group at the moment. What I am seeing is, yes, there is that fear. Yes, there is that territorial stuff going on. There's a lot going on in that group. But I do think it does come from a common place of caring about our professions, about our patients, and actually about each other in a very weird relationship kind of way. I'm not saying it's the ideal relationship, but I do think that people genuinely care about what we're doing and this topic or they wouldn't get so fired up. So hopefully every day will get a little easier. Um, I have a little notebook of like, it's gonna be better today and it will, it has to get better. Um, it's not sustainable the way it is. And it's not sustainable to keep lobbying the way that we have that's not working. And I was serious when I said, if you keep hitting a wall, stop driving your car into it. We've got to take a detour. And I'm not saying we won't get to the same answer. We just might need to take a different approach. And I'm not saying my approach is right. I don't know. I'm a technician that's looking to collaborate with anybody who will collaborate with me. Like, I feel like a homeless little puppy at times. I'm like, please pick me. Come work with me. Um but I do think there's a lot of potential for all of this. So that's kind of where I was coming at today. And I don't know, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I hear this concept of unity or unity discussion or whatever, and all I'm relating to is what I do in my small world here in Colorado. I don't really know what you all are talking about. <laughs> Um, I don't even know if that's a topic for this particular discussion. But anyway, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, but maybe we need some clarity on that because that's such a broad term, unity, unity discussion. And if there are folks listening, I'm, maybe they need to know if there's something specific you're referring to. And I think, I think that's the problem. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> it. Our work group has a meeting scheduled soon. And I think that's where we're getting started. As with everything, I think everybody wants their piece of their pie. They also want their voice heard right now. And they'd like answers right now. Because let's face it, we all come from fast moving practices, right? I really want that animal diagnosed right now so I can start. It's not necessarily how it works. Sometimes it's a few weeks, right? Um, and that is probably what's going to happen with this is I think it will be a little slower than we'd like, but hopefully we can keep the momentum going because I think it's valuable stuff. There wouldn't be this many people involved and this many different side conversations happening if it wasn't necessary. And I do think the IAVRPT is a perfect organization to come up with a global document for all of us to take to whoever's legislating us and try and improve things. And I think that's where it will end up going. I can't speak on behalf of them. I can't speak on behalf of the working committee at this point at all. But my vision would be a document that I could say, this is what animal rehab looks like. This is what everyone brings to the table. And this is what the special skills. So when I say, hey, you should go see Deanna because she's a PT. That's documented as to why you're going to see that PT. So not only for each other, but for our clients, right? You should see a physical therapist instead of Jen Panko because she can do these things. You need to go see Dr. Danielle because she can get you that pain management that your pet needs. Hey, I know your pet needs these things and this is who's going to be the best person for you. And I honestly wish we all had baseball trading cards of what we did and I could just pass them out. I could be like, hey, <laughs> go see number 17. She's got what you need, right? Go and that number 100,000. Whoa, that's a big number. Yeah. <laughs> I love you, Connor. Be hey, quiet. Let the people talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so, um, so what? So what is the goal of Unity, Danielle? What? What? <laughs> so, I mean, what? To answer Deanna's question about what this is about. Yeah, I mean, this today is again. I felt like four different perspectives coming at this is better than I just felt. I felt anxious and bombarded when we were trying to discuss it in the unity stuff. Um, and I feel like I've worked and talked to all three of you. And I feel like kind of like, I feel like we can like at least bring some different perspectives out there and say, what is our ideal? What is our ideal of unity? My ideal of, un you know, idea of unity would 
be, again, communication about every aspect of these patients. And I don't think that's an unrealistic expectation. I know in human medicine, there's direct access for PTs, um, but there's so much disconnect in human medicine between professionals. Like my mom's endocrinologist does not talk to my mom's cardiologist who does not talk to whoever, right? It just doesn't happen. Um, they send their reports off to their GP maybe, but I feel like in vet medicine, we are trained we are trained in everything, right? We are trained to be that neurologist, orthopedist, you know, surgeon, um, internal medicine person. Do we still refer out to boarded specialists? Yes, we do, and we should. But we are tr we are multifaceted, trained in those things, and so I feel like in vet medicine, you just it's not the same. And in Canada, let's use Canada as an example because that's where I am. I feel like. There's a lot of waiting around. There's a lot of disconnect um, with medical professionals. And, and our healthcare is paid for, right? So people don't see the worth there. And veterinary medicine mm -hmm. doesn't operate like that. Veterinary medicine, if we treated people or animals like people are treated in the medical profession sometimes, I'm like, we would never have any patients and clients coming in the door. They want value and they want to feel valued and they want their pet to feel like they're doing the best thing possible. And these are members of their family. And I think, I think we can just do better. So um, I do believe unity means collaboration and medical record transfer and and yeah, I'm on the phone going, okay, well, and, and yes, these are other veterinarians. So I get there's people that don't agree that that's interprofessional collaboration, but I would ha have no problem as a GP. So let's back my education up 10 years when I'm not rehab certified. If I was educated and went, okay, this PT is doing a great job. I'm going to refer off to her. I'm going to make sure she knows what she's doing. I'm going to send her the medical records so she has all of the information. Or I'm going to tell my client, you know what? Before I refer you off, can you just come in for a physical so I can make sure that the weakness isn't caused by cardiac or by cancer or by something else that we're missing? And then I'm going to send you to the PT for all the things that you want. I mean, that's my ideal, right? Or the technician, right? Um, I just feel like if you don't have all the answers, that's when mistakes are gonna get made and that is not in the best interest of the patient. So, you know, having something that just has a nice little framework on what unity might look like so then I can go to my college who's making these, trying to make legislative changes that just don't seem in the best interest of anyone, the PTs, the vets, definitely not the patients. Um, direct access isn't the answer and there aren't enough veterinarians who want to even have to deal with any of it. They're overwhelmed in regular practice as it is. They don't want to have to oversee a rehab tech or a PT, right? I think, and you know, someone, I can't remember who it was, maybe it was Karen Atlas, brought up kind of some of the legislation with calling them assistants. Well, that doesn't do anybody any good either, right? They're not assistants. They have a vast education on physical therapy. So let's not devalue anyone. Let's all talk. Let's all communicate. Let's get something in place that we can now go, I can go to the CVO and say, hey, this is how it could work and should work. And maybe then they'll listen because they want information but they're not really communicating with anyone who knows anything before they're trying to set out these legislations not in our area again that's different globally but anyways i just rambled well and danielle there's that liability piece too right that totally. if you is it that if you refer then you are liable no matter what yeah so if i refer to a non-dvm and something goes wrong uh, it's my license that they can go after. Um, is that in your practice act or that's just, yeah, that's our college. Um, oh, okay. So well, and the college is your regulatory body. Correct. Yeah. Oh, um, gotcha. And so legally, legally the college will not let me practice Deanna in anything other than, um, an accredited veterinary hospital. So if you, I could not work for you, um, 
you could work for me under my license, but anything you do is still, oh. I'm still liable for. Gotcha. Uh, the Canadian Physical Therapy Association in Canada um, does not regulate any physical therapy on animals by PTs. Um, so again, no one's regulating that. Um, technicians, if they're registered, Jen, you may know a little bit about that, but I believe the OAVT, you can complain to the OAVT and say, hey, this technician's doing something that's really, really sketchy. Uh, but again, no one's really going into their business and saying, hey, are you properly cleaning in between patients? What are you doing with all your needles? Um, are you, do you have proper medical records? For me to open my practice, first of all, they didn't even have, I mean, Ontario's pretty uh, extensive on what they require for a vet hospital to open. And they didn't even have anything for a rehab facility. So we have to apply as a regular hospital with, and, and mo mobile stuff as well, right? So there's MAV grads and rehab grads that wanna do mobile practice. They have to have an inspection of their car and their house, because that's their kind of stationary oh, point. Yeah. Um, I know someone who had a palliative care practice and she had to move, she got divorced. She moved two doors down and they had they charged her and said, you have to re-accredit your stationary place. She's like, I'm literally two doors down, nothing else has changed, but the address changed, which means she has to re-accredit her whole practice. Wow. And so we're under such strict guidelines that you know this came up in the unity discussion i can't go to an agility meet unless i have a mobile license and to get that mobile license i have to have oxygen and surgical packs and all this other crap in my car that i don't need to have the the cbo is understanding that things are changing and so they are they are starting to be a little bit better about going okay well we'll waive those but you still have to apply to and it's 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 a process right and we are, seem to be the only ones being regulated in ontario possibly in as across canada um as far as when we're doing rehab <laughs> and so yeah very uneven and as a technician it's even more complicated and i don't know if it's like that out there in BC, Jen, but I mean, they can practice in Ontario without being registered. They could go through their whole program and not take their R exam. So if they are registered, no one's regulating if them, I'm, right? If I want to make a bucket of money, grab my leg, grab my dog gym equipment, go to all the competitions right. and be a one hit wonder. Ethically, whoa, I would never do that it's completely out of my comfort zone it's completely disrespectful um, to the veterinarians that work with those pets it is completely disrespectful to the client they don't know that they think totally. they would love it they would yeah. all show up and line up and sign up and get their time hand me their cash and it would be like whoa this is great not great because a i know the process of rehab i know the process of fitness all those things giving a random laser wand if you need that <laughs> you need more than me you need dr lane you need something else you don't oh, need yeah, jen don't need and yes Pinko. i could do that and <laughs> but it just puts a bad name on it and it's hard because other places do it and other people do it and why is jen panko not out there promoting her business and why does she not like the agility people what what's the issue why is she not coming to the shows on the weekend because it's a lawsuit waiting to happen, or as the Malinois <laughs> people say, a mal. So, so I just received a, a comment from one of our live viewers directly. Um, very good input there, Jen. I I am glad that you're following, you know, your heart and your mind and and your ethics. Um, so so yeah, what what is missing in this discussion, perhaps, is like the consumers or the the clients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, so I'll just do my piece and then listen to you guys. But that that is what the um, practice acts are all about. That's what the vet boards are about is consumer protection um, and, and you know public health, animal welfare and everything. But I know um, when we were dealing with the chiropractors wanting to carve out chiropractic or manipulation from veterinary medicine and all this stuff, talking to the regulators, it, their concern was consumer protection most of all. It wasn't really animal welfare, animal health, this, that and the other. And so 
Um, you know, I think that a lot of what drives the impetus to change laws, because I know the Veterinary Medical Board, they were tired of hearing complaints like, why can't I see my physical therapist, uh, blah, 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 blah. And so their desire to have some kind of working model that we could collaborate and that everybody would be more happy with that um, was because it was bugging them to have to deal with this repeatedly. Um, so I think that, so from my piece, what do I want for clients? I, I want somebody that will make a good solid diagnosis, use their hands. So I think that the veterinarians, they need better information on how to do a myofascial complete diagnosis, feeling the animal, not watching them walk and assuming it's it's something, assuming it's something surgical. I want clients to have non-surgical options. I see rehab as not post-surgery rehab, but as you rehab, you had something happen to you. Let's see what we can do before surgery. I'm very non-surgical myself, as you know. Um, and so, so just, just listening to, to you guys, I, I mean, you know, and then I love my clients and I love my patients, uh, you know, whatever the species, but um, so I care for them and I want to protect them and I want to protect them from harm when I see that being a possibility. And so I know that I tend to be outspoken and and want all this accountability and transparency, but it comes from that position of not wanting harm and caring for people. So wondering if if you guys can talk about where the client fits in in all this. Yeah, yeah I agree with that as well. And and when when in Colorado we started the process of working on our practice act changes, we had a consumer advocate with us from the get go, that was Connie. And I remember many times meeting with the vet board, um, staying true and just stating out loud, this is all for, um, I see everybody's laughing. This is all for um, protection of the animals and, and the consumers. So. Sorry, that was just a little inappropriate. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> one, of Deanna's, one of Danielle's uh, dogs gave us a rare glimpse of. It was like, Cat, yeah, cat, cat, the opposite uh, spectrum. Anyway, so, go on, Deanna. Yeah, no, yeah, and so, um, and and Narda and I were talking the other day about when we started this process in Colorado to get the Practice Act change. The way it happened was, I met with uh, the Colorado Vet Board with Connie joining me as a consumer advocate to talk to them about hey, I'm a PT, I'm seeing a few patients here without direct supervision because I need to do these case studies for my canine rehab certification program. Is this gonna be okay? Or am I gonna get a cease and desist <laughs> letter? So we went over all my communication processes and Connie spoke on my behalf as well. And they said, no, what you're doing is fine. Um, I know that if there was an issue, I wouldn't have had a legal leg to stand on, but I wanted to just put it all out there. This is what I'm doing. But from that first conversation, the board members were saying, we are hearing more and more that the consumer wants animal rehab. We're also hearing about it, that they want chiropractic services, which really at that point was very concerning to them. And they said, maybe we need to start dealing with this now, particularly with animal physical therapy, because you're sitting here in front of us talking to us about it. They're the ones that open the door as far as trying to get something figured out how we can do this so that human trained PTs uh, could do animal physical therapy. And so I just remember driving home from that meeting and Connie and I were so elated and shocked and just never even expected that to come out of this first visit. But through that whole process, which took us three years, the big motivating factor was animal and consumer safety throughout the whole process. Um, and I so much appreciated the vet board and the Colorado Veterinary Medical Association just staying so true to that while we were coming up with the proper legislation. Well, and and as you and I have talked before, that that was kind of it, it was made so much more blendable and easy because and easy in quotes, I guess, but um, <clears throat> because of who you are 
and who what and what Carrie brought to the table as well. And then she went on to get a PhD from you know CSU and yeah. on <laughs> but um but I think that our our vision also had to extend not only from the creme de la creme, which are you and Carrie, Adrian, um, but also anybody else. So it has to be everybody has to meet this minimum amount. Minute, right, right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. You're right. And and we all were putting our heads together, figuring out what what should this be the minimum criteria um, again with consumer and animal safety in mind, which brings me I never answered your question. Like you mentioned, Danielle, about the dog with the abdomen mass. Would that be picked up as therapists? We are trained to look for red flags. And even though I get a referral from a vet, which means in Colorado, they have to have a veterinary client patient relationship and have to have seen the, the animal within the past year. I never assume, even if they saw the vet last week, that they're free and clear. I still will take on the responsibility of assessing them at every visit about what is going on as, as the whole patient within my skill set to do so. And there may be times that things just don't seem right and I can't even put my finger on it, but, you know, rest assured, then I would be contacting the veterinarian and, and even if I can just relay what I'm finding with my hands or clinical symptoms I'm seeing, the two of us can help then maybe put together, all right, do we need to get the dog back in to be examined and, you know, all those kinds of things. So, um, that's how that kind of process would work out. And I've had dogs who I've seen who the vet just saw them the week before and I may catch something also because I'm in their home. Right. Animals, I think, also may behave differently than they do in the clinic setting. And so sometimes I can pick up on stuff maybe that that you don't see in the clinic. Right. Well, and like you said, it's a different lens, right? And oh, I've right, had right. Clients before they're like, well, how come my vet didn't catch that? And I'm like, it's a different way of looking at things and different mm -hmm. way of looking at patients. And the training we get allows us to find those things. Um, and so, you know, even having the vet student that I had last week, she's like, the way that I examine these patients, the way that we look for gait abnormalities and all these other things is not something that she was taught, but she was so excited about and yeah. so you know i think for us all of our professions none of us know everything right and it's to continue to teach pt students what what options are out there and have them go if they think that this is an option i mean yes it's nice to spend a week with a veterinarian like is required in in Lori's course but maybe a little bit longer i i know my week that i spent doing rehab for my CCRP ex externship, it wasn't enough, right? Like one week was not enough to see what I needed to see um, moving forward and, and really perfect my skills and my techniques and my exams. And so I think we just need to keep teaching one another and yeah. getting to the students and saying, hey, Great. I'm glad that OBC has prepared you for your Navli and I hope you rock it, right? I hope you'll go in there and you just rock that Navli. But after that, <laughs> let's talk about other ways to maybe examine these patients and talk about the SOAS, which, you know, a lot of them still don't know what that is. And let's talk about what other potential causes are from a myofascial standpoint, not just a, you know, is it a cruciate, is it not a cruciate? Because, you know, we, we had this discussion a lot last week, just because it comes in and it's lame on that hind, it does not mean it's a cruciate tear. And and what is an atypical cruciate? <laughs> right? We've, I've had that discussion. Where I'm like, well, really, what is it? Because then if it's atypical, is it actually a cruciate? So, so these things need to... It's just about education and we can easily say, you know what, these vets don't know anything and, and, you know, so we just need to take this over. But I think, I think it's not about that. It's about educating them. And I think, you know, I send my report off to the referring vet and they're like, oh, I didn't know that. Or, oh, I wish I had that. And don't ask me about, you know, 
any new advances in ophthalmology, like I'd be like, mm. <laughs> I haven't done ophthalmology in a very long time. Yeah, it's all, it's all again, all about knowing what we know and knowing what we don't know. Oh, and, that's right. And being and, comfortable with that and, and yeah, um, communicating that as well. Mm -hmm. And not only to our other people on the team, but the, the pet owner and, and whatnot. Yes. Well, Right. I mean, and I think that the clients back to them, I mean, they need to know that there are options. They need to know that there yeah. are non-surgical options for the putative cruciate issue, which might not be that at all. Uh, and and then even spinal cord injury and intervertebral disc disease, all these things that that they don't have to choose between a very invasive surgery and euthanasia or sticking their animal in a small cage for six or eight weeks or whatever. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that that is imperative too, because that will drive the veterinarians to um, learn more about this. And and just one piece before we wrap up whenever we do, um, that, that I think that in addition to the indirect supervision, if that could be worked out, then a big missing piece that we can now see a remedy for are telecommunications. And so mm -hmm. whether we're going to FaceTime or Zoom or, or whatever, that, that I think that sending a video of the animal as they are back to the vet, just short, whatever, let them see it or let them, if they're interested, they can talk to the client, they can see the animal, they can watch you do the treatment. I mean, it's really fascinating to see what's going on. And I think that veterinarians would learn by that visual piece. And, and I know how, uh, how diligent you are about your record keeping and all the details, Deanna, and, and that is important. And that is, that's what's required by our, our all arrangement yeah. with the legality yeah. thing. But if they could see you work, I mean, that is just such a model for, for just concentrate focused engagement on the patient. And, um, and also is a model for how veterinarians that are burnt out, depressed, whatever with corporate or other practice that they see the mm. animal for five or 10 or 15 minutes. And that's what we're showing them is that you can have a life that is happy and very patient-centered, bond-centered practices, and you spend an hour with your patients, and you're happy at the end of the day, not burnt out. Yeah, yeah, that's you're right. True. I think we need to educate owners. Like that's a yeah. big thing, right? Mm -hmm. Educate owners as to the differences between going to a place that does not have an a certified person. Um, I think if you have a PT or a tech or a DVM or whatever, and they've gone through their rehab certification and they're educated, then that is very different from going to a pool who claims to do rehab or even going to a, a chiropractor who is doing rehab without any training right and yep. i think i think that is the key and doing part of the course is not the same as finishing that course and writing your exams um and and i think people don't understand that difference so do i believe that we they need to have access to as much as possible absolutely but educated access. Well, and, um, you know, from the liability perspective here in the States and Colorado, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm liable. If the vet sends me someone, I'm, I'm the one that needs to be responsible for the liability. And I'm happy to take on that responsibility. And I should take on that responsibility. And then if I have clients who are pursuing services, you know, like you say, maybe with uncertified folks or whatnot, um, there may be times that I'm like, okay, could I join you for that visit so I can see what that person's doing and learn from that person what services they're providing and that kind of thing. And sometimes that works out really well. I get a whole nother person I can add to my toolbox um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just a lot of collaborating, but the liability issues, I think certainly I could see why that's complicated in Canada. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes, it is. <laughs> Jen, do you have anything to add to that before we wrap um, up? I actually have to go take my little person to school and go proctor the vet tech student's large animal exam, which is so much fun. It's practical. Um, <laughs> but I did have a harebrained Jen Panko idea. And I really think that our profession could benefit from this. I think that I need to start lobbying, let's call it lobbying, for networking opportunities at conferences. And I mean speed dating style because, listen, I didn't, I don't know Narda. I don't know Deanna. 
I learned a lot from this conversation right here while I was cutting up an apple, getting a pillow put on my face and having a wrestling match with my child. So imagine meeting people that we see on the internet that are giving opinions, all sorts of stuff, meeting them in person and having those conversations. I feel like these groups or even discussion groups could be so important. So that was what I took from this. So I thank you all for including nice me in it. Meet you. And I appreciate the opportunity to just chat with you all. Um, and I'm thinking of ways to improve unity, starting with either, I mean, it's COVID time, so maybe it does need to be online, but maybe we need to have little meetings and get to know each other instead of posture against each other. Something to think about. Yes. I will roll it around mm -hmm. in my little brain. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Deanna. Thank, Thank you, Marta. And uh, everyone have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.